Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Now, before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription, well, that really helps build the channel. Uh, you know what's even better? Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Yeah, that's this one here, Wine World TV. This is part three of a six-part series of Chilean Carmenere. Like all the wines in this series, this is a free sample, and I have free reign to review it however I wish. Uh, way back in episode 99 of the WWTV area, era, era, the current one that we're in, I did a detailed segment on Chilean wine. Nothing has really changed from that, so if you want to know more, then hit the link in the description. Watch the first seven minutes, I guess, yeah? That episode's links also include a ton of resources, so you check it out. Today's wine comes from Morande. It is their Vitis Unica Carmenere. I reviewed their Sauvignon Blanc last year, so if you want to get the detailed background about them, hit the, up the link below to that episode. The shorter version is that the winery was founded in 1996 by Pablo Morande. He, he is widely considered one of the pioneers of Chilean winemaking, but he didn't just up and decide one day to open a winery with no experience at making wine. He is a fifth generation in the wine industry. He worked for several years for Concha y Toro, who are one of the largest wineries in Chile and make the famous Don Melchor. I mentioned finding their vineyards last year. I found some of them, as in Morandes, I found some more of them, specifically the vineyard for this wine, at their San Bernardino property just outside of Santiago. It took quite some time, but it nailed it again. At least I think it did, I don't know. There are still a couple more vineyards they own that are just not possible to find without more info. At least I, I don't think I can. Luckily, I don't need to know them right now. All right, so without further ado, let's get the stats for this wine. The 2021 Morande Vitis Unica Carmenere suggested retail price, $20. It's from the Valle de Maipo, the San Bernardo Vineyard. Uh, I think I said San Bernardino earlier. Uh, it's 100% Carmenere, certified sustainable Chile, harvest manual, selection manual, fermentation, uh, stainless steel, maceration, three to four weeks, aging 16 months, 80% French oak foudres that are 2,000 to 4,000 liters, and then 20% new French oak barriques, 225 liters. The ABV is 13.5, the TA is 3.59 grams per liter, the pH is 3.42, and the RS is 2.74 grams per liter. As I mentioned in the first of the series, the grape name is spelled in a variety of ways. For the purposes of these videos, I think I've already said this, but I'm going to say it again. Any text on screen will reflect how the winery spells Carmenere. Um, yeah, it's basically, yes. So like I said, if it's a text sheet or, or, or how the winery spells it, there it's going to be like that. But if I'm just like in general talking about Carmenere and for some reason I put the, the name up of the grape, it's, it's going to be in the, it should be in the French uh, thing with the, with the two accents. This is how I remember it. The accents point at each other. Okay. So the first E points, well, in, in my, from my perspective this way, from your perspective this way, and then the second E points back to the other one. That's how I remember how the accents go. Otherwise, you know, I don't know anything about accents in French wine or French, French, the French language. I don't know how they, how they decide which, which way it should go, this, that, and the other, and which letters get accents or not. All right, let's, uh, let's check it out. I remember liking the Sauvignon Blanc. I remember liking all the Sauvignon Blancs in that series. I didn't mention, and you, you, you might be seeing this episode right around the time I'm doing this. Uh, I didn't mention episode one. So there's a Australian, Western Australian wine competition that I, uh, am, I'm in. And the first part was a 60 question theory exam. Um, about Western Australian wine, not just Australian wine, Western Australian wine. I didn't know you could have 60 questions on Western Australia, but you can. And I did really well on it. There are a couple ones after I got the, the, the results back and they gave us the actual exam and the answers to the questions. Ooh, 
hey, somebody else, <clears throat> quartermaster sommeliers, maybe you should be doing something like that. Um, it might have been a few I thought I got right, but I, when I looked at the thing, I got wrong. But uh, I, did, I did really well at it. So I'm a finalist. There's nine of us. Originally, 12 were invited, but three of them are not, are not able to make it to Houston. So I'll be in Houston at the end of August. So probably before this, probably, yeah, after this, this episode is probably happening before that. And uh, first place gets to go to Western Australia. Hmm. Hey, I have a good shot of getting in the top three. And second place thing is 500 bucks. Third place is like a case of wine. I'm like, yeah, a case of Australian wine. And the people who are running it are a couple of master sommeliers. They're fantastic people. I haven't met them in person yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to meeting them. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm super excited about it. So honestly, between now and then, I talked about making maps, which I'm going to be doing, but I also am going to just double check everything about everything Australian that is possible in the competition. They gave us some details recently. So some ideas of how to prepare for it. So I'm just going to try to be as ready as I can. I'm not revealing any of my, any of my strategies in case any of the nine finalists actually watch my stuff, which I don't think any of them do, but we'll see. Anyway, uh, super excited about that. So, um, a little bit deeper color than the second wine. It's not completely opaque, but it's not, com it's not, uh, as translucent. But it's a good red color, and it's red all the way throughout. And this is 2021, so it's only three years old. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty red all the way throughout. All right, let's check it out. All right, so this is more the. This is more that it. It kind of has that cumin thing going on. It has. It kind of reminds me of enchiladas. Now, here's the thing. I'm looking for that first. It's not that's the first thing I smell, though. It's very much a highlight. And what I've liked so far with the with this series this is only the third of the six, is that it's none of these are like fruit bombs. Like the fruit is there, but it's a mixture of fruit and non-fruit characteristics, which is great because that's kind of old school or old world winemaking. Um, though apparently we're not allowed to use old world, new world anymore. I don't know. I still do. Everybody still does. But European winemaking versus non-European winemaking. Um, you tend to have a balance of fruit and earth, fruit and non-fruit, whereas much of the outside of Europe uh, wines, not everywhere, but a lot of a lot of them that where it's super easy to uh, ripen grapes, you tend to be very fruit dominant, very fruit forward, if you will. I get more cranberry than raspberry, but I get both of them here. But earth, uh, dirt, forest floor, dried leaves, garage. Ooh, I just, oh, now I got the hint of like uh, green bell pepper. So it was not just a cumin. So as, as this is getting aerated, those pyrazines are opening up a little more. Yeah, so it's a combination of that. Again, there's a bit, of, there's a roasted quality to this. Um, like you maybe roasted the bell pepper. Yeah, exactly. There's, it's not as much as last week's wine where there was so much of a fajita thing going on. This is more subtle. This is not as much in your face. And even though there's some new oak on this, um, it's, not, it's not coming through um, very, very big. Let's see, how much new oak? It was like 20%? Yeah, it wasn't, it's not like there's, um, it's not like there's a, uh, a judicious amount of new French oak aromas coming through. With that said, I just got a little bit of a caramel thing. So, you know, let's just get on the palate. Hmm. In case the Corvin runs out of gas, I'm ready to go. Um, so the fruit actually has, has come to the forefront a little bit more. And it's kind of vanilla-like too. So the new French oak, it's, it's, it's there, but it's there on the palate. Matter of fact, it gives us like a creamy, um, not candy necessarily, but this, this kind of creamy... Um, quality to it, vanilla coated quality to, to the fruit, and it's brighter. Gives, it gives, makes the fruit brighter. It's not sweet, but it's not as dusty as it came across to me on, on, the, on the nose. It was more of a dusty, just the earth and the, and the fruit, you know, dirt, fr dirty fruit, like not dirty, like bad, but fruit that was in the dirt. Um, now it's like you cleaned off the fruit 
and now you smell the fruit and you can smell that, that the sweetness of the fruit. So you have that, but then is there still earthiness to it? It's, it's, and, and the pyrazines have, have, have dwindled a little bit, but they're not completely gone. It's more spicy fruit. It's like you somehow took the fruit and maybe put some pepper type powder on it. Um, that type of thing. So like here, at least in South Texas and, and possibly Mexico, you'll have, um, you'll have this little like, spice called tahine, which I honestly don't know what tahine is, but you'll put it like on, on watermelon or other fruits, but like watermelon especially. And it gives you that kind of gritty, I mean, it's gritty first of all, but you get kind of this kind of spice component, not spicy hot per se, but you get this like sweet and savory thing going on. Um, so I kind of get that out of the wine. There's like a sweet savory thing or a fruity and, and non-fruit thing going on. Um, so yeah, it's also light in the body. You know, they're really, they're really like almost no tannins. I'm gonna have to look this up. I don't know how tannic carbonara is supposed to be, but there's a little bit, there's a little bit on the gums, but not a lot. It's nowhere near like what you get from a Cabernet Sauvignon. So um, it's really nice. Um, alcohol is well integrated. It's right in the middle of the last, between the last two wines. It's, I, I, there's a touch of burn, you know, I didn't swallow any, but there's a touch of burn in it. Um, but not as much as the 13.9 as last week and the week before 13%, you know, wasn't really, I mean, it was like not noticeable, you know, there's, there's a, a touch of it here. It's a really well-made wine. And on, on the retro nasal, like I'm breathing out through my nose, there is that, there is that touch of smoke going on. It really tastes really good. I like it. All right. It's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell your friends. And we will see you next time again with more Chilean Carbonara.